So I did my project on public key and symmetric key cryptography. Introduce you, yourself. Huh? Introduce oh. yourself. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm Andy Wong from Cluster 4 Cosmos, and I did my project on public key and symmetric key cryptography. So passwords, they're used in everyday life, like for Facebook, email, everything. And um, some very common ways of keeping passwords secure and anonymous and messages secure and anonymous are using public key cryptography and symmetric key cryptography. So I'm going to start with public key cryptography. Um, it was first introduced by Whitfield Diffie and Martin Hellman um, in 1976. It was then when mechanical computers were just like tossed out and replaced with digital computers, which were much faster and uh, more logical thinking and could do much more computations. And um, so that lifted many limitations of the past. Using this extra computing power, uh, Diffie and Hellman came up with public key cryptography. It was a major breakthrough in the world of cryptography. Uh, many people implemented this security system into their products. Public key cryptosystem, uh, crypto systems use a few major concepts and protocols. One of the most important is the Diffie Hellman key exchange. This is a very secure method of exchanging passwords without letting anyone that intercepts the uh, exchange information let them, to let him know the exchange password. It's created based on the assumption that every piece of information we send is intercepted. It may seem almost impossible to accomplish this feat at first, but it, it's, it's actually quite simple and elegant. So, uh, so we start with two people. There's a Bob and Alice. <laughs> so, they first agree on a mutual um, number, or in this case, on my diagram, I use a color, just for easier understanding. So they first agree on a color, let's say like yellow or something. And then they each count their secret which is uh, like well, for Bob it's blue and for Alice it's red. And so the only thing the interceptor knows so far is the yellow, which they mutually agreed on. And then so then they mix the agreed color with their own secret color to create uh, like a public color that they send to each other. So then the interceptor knows both their public colors, which is a mixture of the um, original agreed color and their secret keys. And so uh, so they know the interceptor knows both of them and the agreed color, but uh, yeah. So that's the only thing he knows throughout this whole process. The two sides, Bob and Alice, then each mix their secret key with the received uh, mixed color from the other side, and th then they end up with the same color. But then the interceptor, they, he can't end up with the same color based on uh, the colors he gets because any mixture of them can't uh, receive the end color that both sides receive. So in order to make these so that computers can understand, we use numbers instead. So first, we find a random prime, num prime number, P. So to do this, uh, we first like generate random numbers, and then we had to check their randomness using a few theorems. And the one I'm going to explain right now is the fermat little theorem. Uh, so this is basically, uh, so, if, so x equals 2 to the P minus 1 power in modulo p arithmetic. And so then if x factorial equals 1, then that means p is composite. So uh, then you can't use p anymore. So you just had to keep do, uh, doing this check over and over again until you get a p that's uh, uh, x factorial that's not equal to 1, and then that means p is prime. So after you get that p, uh, each side generates their secret key, let's say uh, q and g. Okay, and then the, they raise g to the they, no yeah they raise g to the agreed prime number. Well, they each raise their secret keys to an agreed prime number, and then they send it to each other. So then uh, the interceptor, of course, only has the agreed prime number and the two uh, sent keys, and he can't do anything like that. So then each side raises that uh, sent received key uh, to their own uh, secret key, and that makes them end up with the same number that the interceptor doesn't know. So that is a diffie hellman key exchange. And it's very secure because it, and it's generally considered impossible to break if the prime number is larger than 10 to the 200th power, which is actually a very big number, but it's easier, easy for a computer to understand. And uh, mm, well, so one problem with the diffie hellman key 
exchange is that it, it, if the interceptor can intercept the message, that means he can actually replace the key with his own key. And then uh, the other side will use his replaced key to encrypt his, the, their message. And then he can actually read that message, re-encrypt it with the other side's key that he originally like, got rid of, and then send it to, back to them. And this way, he knows the message without letting either side know that he read the message. OK, and another major uh, concept that public key criticisms rely on are the RSA system. And this, is, it's very similar to the Diffie-Hellman system, but it's actually uh, kind of different. And um, so it also involves both the private and public key. And so, the, OK, so first, two prime numbers are generated. First, uh, P and Q. And then you both have to get them together to get a number N. So then a cipher key, key is generated that has no factor in common with p minus 1 times d minus 1. And then a decipherment key, d, is generated that uh, satisfies e times d equals mod p minus 1 times q minus 1. So uh, that then you get the decipherment key and decipherment key. Um, this is uh, this system is also very difficult to crack and because of the concept of factoring is actually a lot more difficult than multiplying together. So like discrete logarithms and exponentiation. Uh, yeah. So okay, to use the uh, decipherment key and decipherment key to encrypt and decrypt the system, you f uh, message you first turn a message into a set of blocks, like uh, about four letters for each block. And then a, start, a turns into 0, 0, all the way to z being 25. And then you take the block and uh, raise it to the deciphering key and in modulo n. And then the deciphering is just the same thing, but you raise it to the deciphering key. And public key criticisms are like the most secure. But there's also symmetric key criticisms. And these are uh, generally considered as less secure, but are much faster. So these are usually used in sessions, like as in like email or like uh, chat, maybe. So uh, this uh, a very common method of doing this is AES, where basically we, we they generate uh, like 128, 192, or 256 bit keys, and they take a message and use that to encrypt it, which is actually, uh, okay, so basically they take like the key, they do like a mathematical process to, to uh, mix it in with the original block. So it's still using the blocks, so the blocks are the same length as the key, and they uh, use a mathematical process to encrypt it and mix it together to produce a ciphertext. And then they just reverse the process to get to the original plain text. And this is generally considered less secure because you can actually just like well, reversing the process is like less secure than doing completely different processes in uh, public key cryptography. So yeah. So uh, well, if you want to trade speed for uh, like power, then you just use mm -hmm. secret. Uh, yeah. So. Um, so something that very commonly uses a secret key or, or a public key uh, exchangeably is the Kerberos password system, as in like we use it in this campus right here. And so I, I'm assuming it uses symmetric key cryptography just because of the required key length. Generally, public key crypt systems require a, a shorter key length, and symmetric key require much longer just to stay secure. And another use for them is uh, digital signatures, and this is actually made by, um, so the sender of a message adds their private key to the message, and then that counts as his signature. And then when he, when he sends it to the other side, the other person can verify the identity of the person by using the public key to verify the private key uh, signature attached to the message. And so that's like the main usage of private and public key. But like, there's, hackers are always getting smarter, and they're, they're always finding new ways to uh, decrypt and ha uh, break into these public and private key systems. So we also need to innovate and in 
activate, and eventually maybe even computers could get fast enough to break the factory system. And that would require completing new field of cryptography. So this is the cat and mouse game. <laughs> um, so yeah, possibilities are endless. Thank you. It's a nice overview. So you mentioned this interesting attack on the key exchange system, where somehow the interceptor uh, tricks the Bob and uh, Bob and Alice into using his key rather than their own key. So can you think of any ways to avoid that? I mean, that, that that's. Um, did you read about it? Did you come across any that? Uh, yeah. I didn't come across any way to like stop that, but perhaps maybe like. Like, would this sign encrypt using the other person's key? Maybe he could actually like check that if it's uh, his the other person's key or this key before encrypting using it. Yeah. So that that would, either that would like slightly set up process, it would be a lot more secure than like normal. Yeah, it's the same sort of authenticate. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. That's basically it. Yeah. Very good.